done now. Yep. So, I'll do the introduction. So, this is the last talk of 2023. Thankfully, unlike last year, 2022, we have had a full year of most of monthly talks, and we hope that this will continue in the new year. Some years ago, I was fortunate to meet tonight's speaker, uh, Michael Harnett. I found him to be a most knowledgeable, interesting person. He explained to me his family connection with the Gaelic O'Sullivan clan, and I persuaded him to write an article on, his, uh, on this connection, which we published in a previous Duke Sometime before this, the Society had made a trip to the Kidgy Fields in County Mayo, um, which are some five to six millennia old. I found this, for me, to be a mind-blowing experience. I realized then that medieval, uh, early medieval, medieval and modern history on which we concentrate was only a relatively short space in the overall history of planet Earth. There was a huge area of prehistory about which we know or knew very little. Those of us who had read the books of the Old Testament, um, sorry, had got little glimpses of this in the area of what is now uh, the Middle Eastern part of the world. This, however, only relates to perhaps 10,000 years B uh, BC. I started to read a little of the work of Trinity Professor R.A. McAllister, the late R.A. McAllister, and realized that our planet and Homo sapiens was much, much older again. The recent concentration on dinosaur finds and the improved dating technology emphasizes this. I then found out that Michael was actively researching prehistory and indeed had written a series of books on the subject, which in fact are available or some of them are available at the back of the, uh, at the hall. I also discovered that he owned an island off the coast of Mayo, which had Neolithic artifacts, among other things, on that, on that small island. One of, his, one of his objectives was to relate this general history of the world to our own island of Ireland. So, with this brief introduction, without further ado, I give you tonight's speaker, Michael Harnett. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming to listen to me. I hope I don't bore you too much. Um, if anyone really gets less lost, let me know and put your hand up if they get lost. But otherwise, there's nothing too difficult here. But I'm going to cover a huge area of time. Um, Lecture was to be a sim single lecture on my ninth grandfather, the O'Sullivan Bear. Um, but then I sort of sat back and said, I can't do that because we are, I'm fed up of judging the Irish leader under English terms. Um, there's a whole lot of things in Irish society that were normal to him. Things like fostership, things such as um, marriage being a one-year contract. Um, this, you've got to understand the people and their pride in their history to be able to understand their actions. So to do that, I went back to understand the Brecon laws. Where did they come from? In fact, where did our people come from? And then that brought me down a, a big rabbit hole that ended up in this lecture, and hopefully the, and the first section of which is going to get people into Ireland. And I want to get you to that point. I'm going to start that Homo sapiens is known on this planet for 300,000 years. Yet, modern history will only tell you we learned about the wheel maybe three, 4,000 years ago. We learned about mathematics probably even less than that. So we have got our history so, so wrong. And modern science is now, a lot of the discoveries I'm going to be telling you about now, have only come to light in the last 10 years, which sort of bolstered it. So go back to my earlier start. I loved, as a child, color the dots, or at least join the dots and make a picture. I went on to be a, a systems analyst. And for that, you've always got to understand the picture. You've got to understand where the dots go all the way along the line to get the overall picture. And that's where history, for me, never had any interest. And history was a highly illuminated dot, 
and then you get another dot. 1066, you might have one dot and everything about it, and then you've got another dot, but it doesn't connect those dots often. Because what makes it more complicated is that when a victor wins, they eradicate all the dots before. And the problem is trying to understand the overall picture, having got people in there changing the history. History is written by the victors. I mentioned earlier, I wrote a book, a series of books on the Gaba Labana Erin, and that was fantastically eye-opening for me, because it sort of brought back all of the Irish literature and read through what the victors, how they changed them, and gave a story behind that. So this is what comes out of this. So I'm going to start at the beginning, the Irish people. And I love Francis Bacon now. As a student, I didn't like him at all, but he said a lot of common, common sense. And truth is the daughter of time, and I hope some of the truths will come out today. I'm going back to 12,800 BC, and you can see there a Google Earth of the planet. And I want you to imagine that every light blue area that you see in front of you was land. The sea level was 400 feet lower than it is today. And it was, um, and that's where the people who were around would have been living. I want to highlight at this point, in fact, I haven't got my notes up here. Go to, uh, I'll just go on without them. I know where it is there. Right. The um, Malta is one area I want to highlight. Malta was on dry, uh, obviously Malta is dry land, but it was connected to Sicily. It was also connected to North Africa. Um, if you look around the Britons, they also were connected to the mainland Europe. And if you go around the world, you'll see that basically Asia was connected down through to Australia. And I'm talking only 13,000 years ago. So I'm going forward from there. I have highlighted in the immediate area the areas of land, the coastal area. You'll notice that the Mediterranean Sea was actually disconnected from the ocean and was most definitely fresh water. Um, evidence now is that literally again three or four years ago off the coast of Sicily they find huge freshwater reserves below the sea which means it had to have been fresh water at that time for that to happen. Um, let's go on to the next one and so I use Malta as my uh, example here, I could have chosen one of the islands or Florida, or I could have used Indonesia, but I want to use here Malta. Those, there's an enigma, as they put it, the tracks. These are tracks carved, worn into the limestone. There's not just a few, there are miles of them right across the island. The only problem is they continue on under the sea. So it's pretty obvious that they were, they're certainly man-made, and they were made before the sea levels rose, which means they were made about 12,000 BC, because that's the period of the time the land started to rise, the sea levels started to rise. I'm going to come back to some of these areas again. The next thing is I want to show you a bit of geography here. The red line are mountains. Those mountains effectively were a great big dam and you'll notice the break in the red line, and that break in the red line is where the Bosphorus is now. So again, I'm going to explain that later. If you think about it, most of Turkey is the high land, going right on out to beyond to even as far as China, the Himalaya. That is a continuous line of mountains, and it'll be relevant. I want to add to that scenario, the Ice Age lasted for 120,000, between 100 and 120,000 years. So just think of the rain that would have fallen in 120,000 years, all stored up in that ice pack. Twelve thousand years ago, it started to thaw. It thawed reasonably quickly because we know that 2,000 years later it had almost gone completely and the island had become, you know, um, ice-free and we know that there's a... and there's a vague variation on the depth of it, if you, well, depends on what you read, but certainly a minimum of 3,000 feet and possibly 10, possibly even 20,000 at the peak, which is in North Africa, depth of ice. When it melted, 
What was the Black Sea today? The Caspian and the Aral Sea was one huge freshwater lake. Overflowing, and if you think of maybe a hundred times rainfall, or possibly even if you're talking a hundred thousand, a hundred times rainfall at a minimum, melting and coming down through that, the amount of flows of water would have been massive. And we look at our geography from the other bits. In fact, we think it probably went out through the Red Sea rather than the Mediterranean as we know it. Okay, so why after a hundred odd thousand years did it suddenly start to melt so quickly? And that was always another problem. And now they think there's an area which we do know of called the Younger Dryas. And that happened in around that time and things suddenly started to change. The planet actually dropped seven degrees C. We're panicking now about it going up one or so. It dropped seven degrees C. And so there was, a, and I'm only talking 12 or 13 years ago. So what probably now has come to light in the last four or five years is that there was a major incident. A long time ago, a giant space rock slammed into what is now Greenland. If you're wondering why you haven't heard of this massive meteorite crash, that's because for millennia, evidence of the impact was hidden beneath the ice of Hiawatha Glacier in northwest Greenland. Until now. Recently, aerial radar surveys revealed a depression under 930 meters of ice, and now an image of the meteorite impact has taken shape. At 31 kilometers across and about 320 meters deep, the hole rivals the size of cities like Washington, D.C. and Paris. Researchers put it among the 25 largest impact craters on Earth. The space rock was probably a rare iron asteroid. To leave such a dent in Earth's crust, it had to be roughly 1.5 kilometers wide. And when the asteroid hit, it vaporized up to 20 cubic kilometers of rock. That's enough rock to fill 15,000 astrodomes. Other signs of the fiery fallout persist in the landscape. Quartz crystals and sediment from a nearby river show deformities typical of the space rock collision. The impact sent molten bits of rock from Earth into the air, and glassy grains in the same sediment may even be some of that flash melted debris. The big question is, exactly how old is the crater? It's probably no older than the ice sheet. That formed at the beginning of the Pleistocene. So the crater is probably somewhere between 2.6 million and 11,700 years old. But only further studies can confirm and narrow that range. A lot rides on the age of the crater. There's a fierce debate over something called the Younger Dryas. That's the technical name for a chilly period that began about 12,800 years ago. But we don't know exactly what triggered the deep freeze. If the age of the Hiawatha crater... Watch that high, tsunami. It could bolster a controversial hypothesis that a space rock caused the thousand-year cold snap. Don't worry about this slide, except the bottom right-hand picture. I want you to look at, oh, hang on, I can modify here. I want you to look at that peak there, okay? That peak on that crater is a lot less than we're expecting. And that is very strong evidence that it came through thousands of meter of snow. So a lot of its energy was lost by the time it came down through, so effectively, we're more than likely that was the, the end of the Ice Age, effectively. One estimate from some of the people who calculated this was that it was a thousand million atomic bombs, the amount of energy released. It took planet a thousand years to get the temperature right. But that amount of energy would melt vast amount of the North, of the uh, Ice Age, the ice block, literally vast amount, 20 cubic kilometers of material was vaporized or blown out into space. And when it went up into space, what did it do? What well, goes up, comes down. And the planet spun, and asteroids would have been raining all over the whole planet. In fact, there's up to four inches of material, carbon, high carbon material, which is all the fires that were set right around the world. 
That tsunami, which I asked you to note, could have been as high as 1,000 meters, one kilometer high. That, I don't know how many of you have seen the film. That was a massive blow which would have gone around the world. So just imagine all of those civilizations that were living around the planet on that 400 foot of land I showed you at the beginning. And that's where the majority of them would have been. Most of them would have probably been wiped out. So that's the starting point. Oh, hang on. Close you. Right. Oh, gosh, go away. Clear pen markings. Switch off that. Right. Excuse the dark green. <laughs> but from about that period of time as well, I want to remind you, because this is well known, that from about 10,000 to around about 5,000, the Sahara was green, fertile, rivers, lakes, animals, a lot of rhinoceros. Most of the early ivory was actually rhinoceros, not elephants. Um, and it was a huge area of productive area, which started then to dry out. But I'm now jumping to 10,000 BC. And I want to say, what of those people? And these are our people, because you'll see a lot of current. And these are the areas that the Irish people came from. I want to highlight three places, and the first one is Gobastan. And on that, there is rock carvings, 10,000, five or 6,000 carvings. And this was 10,000 years ago. And what do you see? Boats. And in fact, if you look at the whole drawing, five meters across, not just one boat, but lots of them. The Vikings actually came over and studied this and said, well, these are our people. They, they taught us how to make boats. And this is 10,000 BCE. And interestingly, on the boat on, uh, go back to here, there, there, that symbol, which is used on the drawings, actually interestingly to this story, is a woman um, on, on the boats coming through there. So, right. The next site I want to show you is Gobelki Tepe, which they call a temple area. This, again, was only discovered a few years ago. And I'm, again, I'm talking about 10,000 BCE. Remember, before we traditionally knew about the wheel, we knew we were hunter-gatherers, we were scavenging around in animal skins according to the normal tradition, anything but. This is only a tiny portion of the site that's been uncovered so far. And the type of things they found on it? 20-foot monoliths weighing 20 tons. Detailed carvings, carved straight into the rock, the animals. In fact, this temple itself is all animals, all different animals. Um, and again, just try and put it into, kind of, if I asked you now, as any one of you, go out and carve me a 20-ton slab, and, I, and you can't have any modern tools, how would you go about it? Just think about it. It's the technology that they had there, just to raise that in place. Look at the technology we're using to try and keep it in place. You know, today, think of what was going on at that point. And it was certainly first constructed. And interestingly, once they built it, they buried it. And then they built another one, and then buried it. Um, one of the things also of interest was that it pointed, the lineup of it was pointing directly to the dog star, or Sirius. And wonder, well, why the Sirius? The Sirius in Neolithic times was the star that came first over the horizon before the sun. And the sun, so it was the foreteller of the sun. And you'll find also in later times, Boyne Valley, not only the sun, Cirrus as well. And I can also go to South America, Australia, North America, and all of them tie in with the dog star and relating to it. So this is a in particularly interesting one. There's a professor in working hard in uh, Anatolia at the moment, or in Turkey, and arguing that the one on the very left uh, is the cosmological signs, and he highlights them. And this is the people trying to warn what happened. Because that asteroid that hit would have been seen for weeks before coming closer, would have seen, and they knew exactly what it was. There was no 
where it was coming and was coming for them. It moved at a speed of 30 miles a second, or 100,000 miles an hour. And imagine the bang, one million ton, 11 billion tons would make. Well, I showed the picture of it there earlier. Right, the third place I want to show you, and these are, I believe, again, our direct ancestors, was, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce this properly, but Katahoyuk. And Katahoyuk, again, was discovered probably in the last 20 years. They've only opened up about 5 or 6% of it. But it completely turns upside down what we thought of our ancestors. This is a part of it undercover. You can see it's quite some substantial structure. And what's more, there were eight to 10,000 people living there at that time. Those weren't hunter-gatherers. You don't gather to keep to eight, hunt eight to 10,000 people with the odd lion coming by or the odd buffalo or something. Those were people. Within the pots, they found milk products. They don't know whether they And they made wine. And it seems as if they had a lot of spare time for themselves. This is going in and out here. And right. That gives you another view of the excavations. That is by the site what they expected the houses to look like. They were all tight to each other, no doors. Um, and that is a cutout of the house. Notice the inside fires. Notice the living areas. And interestingly, they, bur they buried their dead under the houses as well. So the, the, the time will come to that later on in the series. But everything was accessed through the roof, probably for animals, for safety, for, we're not sure exactly why, but it came through the, there. There is actually a construction. Someone has gone ahead and constructed a modern version of it. That is a marble statue, carved 10, 12,000 years ago. Interestingly, in Malta, we saw the, exactly the same statues. And they call them sort of asexual because you're not exactly sure what sex they are and they're, they're made almost deliberately so. But they were obviously the same people as were in Malta at the time as well, coming right across. The Oroch was basically the forerunner of the cows. And they were revered big time. Um, and every house had the bull's heads in it. And it was a feature. There was no temples, no churches, whatever, but they did have the bull's head in every house, and it was important. And that bull head can follow right through Fomorians to the Vikings. Interestingly, even inside the houses, they had ochre drawings, pictures, and color coming through. And that's a clay model with the two lionesses. That is one of the girls working in the site. So again, I'm showing you what was there eight to 10,000 years ago, but that was abandoned in around 8,000 before. And so why did they abandon it? Remember earlier I was talking to you about the melting of the, melting of the North Pole, or the North Pole, the, the ice block? Well, I want you to see this red line coming through, and I want you to imagine Ice at the top, sea at the bottom. The red square, which we had here, was that dam, that, remember that line of mountains? And the lowest point of that line of mountains was here, and that point was the Bosphorus. So forget the line, let's talk about what happened. So I'm now 12,000 BC, I've gone back 2,000 years. Three to 10,000 feet of ice, melting, huge amounts of water coming out, flooded it, the whole huge freshwater sea overflowed at the Bosphorus. Mediterranean, or lake as it was at that stage, was 400, meters lower, 400 feet lower, so the water just flowed out. Huge channel. Evaporation was about six to inches to a foot every year over that area, but the flow in was massive, and evaporation made nothing of it. Come forward, to about 10,000 BCE, about the time that those temples I showed you earlier were in, then the water, there's not enough water coming through, evaporation is greater, so the water level drops. 
Little is happening today. The Aral Sea is almost completely dry. The Caspian's a tenth of the size. And the Dead Sea, shrinking the whole time because there's not enough water flowing into it. So what then was brought, that huge flow of water brought highly fertile land, silt. And we all know what um, two weeks did. 100,000 years of rain coming in a very short time, the amount of silt and materials. So this fertile land gets bigger until we get to about 6,500 BCE, about the time that that city became abandoned because this was a fertile country, very, very good for farming and growing, and it was constantly being renewed as the area shrunk there was fresh silt, fresh growing air medium. We certainly know that they had early uh, metallurgy. They know that they were farming animals. Um, they also had from deer to cows, sheep, all the materials coming through. The country was, um, Scythians probably owned country, according to the Scythians, was called Afrig. That gives an idea of the size of it, that tanned area. This is the Black Sea as it is today. This tanned area was the sort of fertile, silty area. I may have even underestimated that because if you look at that point, and I highlight to you that color, that color was probably always dry land as well. So if you take that color being dry land, you can see how much smaller the Black Sea was at that stage. Get rid of you, go to there. Then it happened. In 5600 BC, the sea level rose. Oh, I forgot to say, remember that huge tsunami? It almost definitely then broke through the, at, the, um, at the Pillars of Hercules. And at that point, the, the Mediterranean Sea became saline or became connected. So that was truly the Mediterranean Sea at that time. But the sea levels constantly rose until 5,700, that dried out riverbed suddenly had the water flowing the other way. And as soon as the water started to flow, it would have dug deeply into it very quickly. And they say the whole country was flooded within less than one year. This is an image from Google Earth. I don't know if I can point out to here, I'll try again. Notice the meanders. That is a river through soft ground or soil. You can see that all of us re recognize the meanders. But what I'm going to show you now is where that picture is today. That's the square box. That was ground, fresh land. And that was what was flooded in 5600 BC. This is an image taken underwater. Here is... That is a post cut. There is the remains of a house. Also, they found a lot of the shells there were freshwater shells mixed in, coming in with the salt ones as well. And in fact, interesting to, today, the Black Sea has got a very interesting topography in that once you go down about five or 600 meters, it's completely dead. There's no circulation because of the fresh water that's still stuck there and will rust things like mad, but that's nothing. So this is where we really start coming in. Uh, McAllister's work produced a series of books called the Labagabana Errand, which is the invasions or the work of the invasions of Ireland. And the first mention we have of this is a girl called Sessa, who came from Africa. Interestingly here, she was the son of Enduring Bith, which a lot of people argue was also, um, it's been partly Christianized this as well coming through. So therefore Bith was Noah's son. Fosterling of Sabal. So Fosterling again comes in. Sabal with the pharaohs. So these people sort of migrated once the Great Flood happened. And some of them became the pharaohs, but they were still connected and related to the fostership, which I'm going to detail more what fostership was. But it was a way of connecting also countries and peoples together. You'd give your son to someone else to be brought up, and that would connect the link, the two tribes or peoples together. So, Sessa, according to the Ararish books, left Africa and went straight down 
to Meru, which is in Sudan now, but then was part of the Egyptian Empire. Um, other people left at the same time, obviously, because it was flooded. They only had a year to get out. The green ones went, became the Mongols. The, tr tr troub, the tribe of Danon, which ends up becoming the Tooth to Danon, the tribe of Danon, actually follow the rivers coming back up. And they bring with them farming techniques. And in fact, this has always been a bit of a question. Why did suddenly the hunter-gatherers all change very rapidly? And again, this is one of the reasons. The knowledge came with these people fleeing from this flooded area. There were, there were definitely the settled peoples, which we're talking about. Then there were also, I remind you, this whole area right across Europe was sort of forested or wooded or even tundra further up. And there would have been hunter-gatherers. So there were two types of people same people, but two communities. A lot of the people went to Babel. Tigris and Euphrates was the original seat of a lot of the peoples as well. Interestingly, it also shrunk by half with the rising of the seas at the bottom. Um, and again, we see this in biblical terms. You know, the uh, Tower of Babel, the multiple languages, Frankly, it was just overcrowding, big time. Refugees in thousands, hundreds, possibly tens of thousands, all coming in from it. And the Sumerians, the Assyrians were already there anyhow. So the next thing that happens there is they basically explode out again. And we'll come to that later. But I want to come down the blue line, which is according to the literature, is Sessa, coming to the pharaohs in Egypt. And she tries to set up in Meru. At this point, I'm going to get raise the sort of idea of the religion or beliefs and this is going to be critical six millennia later but this is where it starts. There were, at the very the oldest beliefs, no matter what the religion was, the oldest beliefs that go back um, across the board was that God created chaos from himself. There was absolutely nothing and then God said, I'll create chaos. And then the next thing he did is he created time. And then he produced cycles in time for iteration. And I'll bring pi in. Pi was well known by these people at that stage. And being everything, he would experience everything in all of his forms. So I was made of the part of God that was there. You, so were you. So was the river, so was the mountains, so was the stars. Everything was made from the same bit. Now, the, what I call the Episcopalian, or let's put the Egyptian version of that was, they changed it slightly and said, God created everything from chaos, but stood away from it. God, he visits earth, and in the Egyptian pharaoh's time, he would invade or come into an idol or into a statue that was made. And then at later times, the pharaohs would have been God's communicant and knowledge. And the religion also changed to say that it was man's duty to thank God right through, and because God was separate, and in reward, he would be given some sort of reward, heavenly or otherwise. All religions, bar none, fall into one of those two categories, including science. Science is a religion. It has two faith steps. One is that the black hole, everything came from a black hole. That's one faith step. And the other was the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It's another religion. And we built a whole of our knowledge on that, on those two faith steps. So I raise it now because it's going to come critical later on in the, in the talks. And just to emphasize it, I'm going to show the Christian terms from John. In the beginning was the word, in the beginning, start of time. So time had not, before that, it became. And the word was with God, and more importantly, and the word was God. If you think of replacing word potentially, use your own ideas on this, but if you replace uh, word with potential, then again, that has a bit more meaning. In other words, you have add time and you have a potential to be you, to be a river, to be whatever. The same was in the beginning with God, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything that was not made. There was no outside, there was no 
devil outside, there was no other gods, there was no nothing. That was it. In him was life and the light of men. Light is also critical because light was seen by the ancient people as important. Be it the biggest light we know was the sun. The sun was known in Scythians as Helios, in, in Ra, um, you have Baal. Um, in fact, pyramid was the circle, pi, Ra, God, man. It was the connection between man and God and coming through. And I'm not preaching here, not, but it's understand, understand that it, it comes later on. So, she leaves Meryl because I think the, the two clashed a little bit. The other why we're here, I also want to point out topaz down here. Topaz is where the stone comes from, and you'll find stopa, topazes are important in a divining instrument called a merket, which is also used for building purposes. And merkets are found throughout Ireland. I just raise it here for later on. We'll come back on to that. So she goes back to the Caspian Sea. Remember where those boats were all put in? And according to our literature. And she spends a period of time there. And then she leaves. And along with her come the Fomorians. And they head off and come to Ireland. Um, cover the Scythians. Cut the Caspian. Cover that. Right. Next. The DNA which we have, we'll talk a bit more about it later on, maybe not today, but later on. The DNA is starting to show our connections. This is a, that found relating to our, the Irish being connected to the Middle East coming on through. What was happening at the other time? Once you had the technology, and it was seated very closely before in Africa and in Egypt, but once the technology, all those people that exploded back out again, brought with them their expertise, their metalworking knowledge, their uh, building knowledge, their farming knowledge, etc. I want to bring you, show you one thing. There, we'll come to that in a moment. And that suddenly means that the knowledge gets moved and people get expertise in building things different areas. So the next corollary of that is trade. And if you have trade, you then want to have control over the trade. And you suddenly find the Egyptians grabbing territory, moving in and taking countries all the way the north, along the North Africa. They went by chariot. On the south, on the north of the Mediterranean, the Hittites did something different, except they did it by persuasion. And they did it by persuading people to join them as a trading group. Um, that left a whole lot of people out people who lived on islands, people who didn't want to be part of the supergroups, etc. And their names are all known because in, in the next talk you'll see how they actually literally destroyed the superpowers in a few thousand years time. But we know the number of them, the Shekeles from um, Sicily, the Sheridan, Sardinia, um, the Terrish, it's, uh, names are up there, you can see them, but they were peoples that mostly were on boats or lived by the sea, I had communication. But there was one set of sea peoples that did really well, and that were the Phoenicians, in between the Levant area, which is between the two superpowers. And because they were expert in boating, they got the trade from everyone. Um, in fact, they started off by selling, um, by bringing timber to build the pyramids the, because there was no structural timbers left because of the drying out of the desert, etc. There was less and less timber. And the uh, cedar of Lebanon was the, the first real things they started to use for building purposes. But they went into a whole lot more, including, I don't know if I have it here, where they got their name from. These little fellas, you've seen them on the seashore, little curly whelks. That was the purple dye that gave the Phoenicians, which were named by sort of the Greek name for purple people, because these dyes were um, crit critical, um, were important, and were one of the traded items, and they got their names from that. Um, the Wehesh, no one really knows where they are. But I suspect, with reasonably good reason, the Wehesh were the Fomorians. And the Fomorians 
were the first, along with Sessa, the first people to settle up in Ireland. The trade, come to that. Oh, it's worth pointing out, do you notice the Azores? Neolithic buildings in the Azores. Think about it. Neolithic buildings, you know, these type of things I'm talking to you about then. Anchors that two men couldn't lift. So they were trading or moving boats out to the Azores a thousand miles into the Atlantic in Neolithic times. We're way beyond coracles carrying people. So the Fomorians and Sessa came first, and there were two factions, I think. Fomorians were really just the sea peoples, the ones who, the, so, and they settled in the west of Ireland. Um, they, um, as sea peoples, they were mostly trading, and they found a huge resources here in Ireland, which I'll come in a few moments on to. Um, and this ended up becoming their territory, but when you look at the next map, which was, I agree, that, thank you, this map was produced in, is it on the other screen? Yeah. What can I do, Cahill? <laughs> it can't be at my end. It's on that screen. Okay, I'll talk about it anyhow. That map was Ptolemy's map, probably pronouncing him wrong. Um, he was from Alexandria area. And he had... Um, taken all his drawings and things from ancient maps that were around all over the place. So they were, I mean, they were going back as long as anyone can tell. It's working, it's just not showing it. It's on the channel. What do you want me to do? Try switching the slides, I think. Yeah, yeah. Too complex. Um, is it just too complex? Right, okay, I'll go to, uh, this one's not important <laughs> because I'm doing a highlight of it in that one. Right. <laughs> that one is a, is a blow up of the area and you can see in the top left hand corner, Ireland. It is a lot bigger on that map than it is in reality compared to the other countries and that was because of the importance that Ireland had. And it was highly important. In fact, we probably get the name Britons from the Scythian meaning Fire Islands. Fire Islands because, as you'll see soon, there was a huge amount of trading. And they supplied, in fact, um, you'll find, I was going to come into the moment, but I'll do it now. Um, the biggest copper mine in the whole of Europe was in Mount Gabriel, down in the south of Ireland. And there were two major suppliers of copper for Ireland. One was Ireland, and the other one was Switzerland. Now, there were countries like Cyprus that was named after copper. There were certain areas in that as well, and they were experts in copper. But most of the raw material at this period of time, um, certainly from here onwards, come Ireland. And we'll find in the next lecture, you're going to find that people come up to exploit that copper in Ireland. But when you look at the Poltemi's map, you can see the way that they saw the land, and that was the, 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 I've highlighted it yellow, that was the Fomorian domain, which goes across from Ireland, the Orkneys, across to Scandinavia, etc. This is a map of Ireland. Actually, I'm not doing too bad in time, I think. We're about to go too long. This is a map of Ireland, and I wanted to highlight a few areas in it. First is the Cady Fields, which we're going to talk about in a second. The, the next is, and this, the Cady Fields, um, I'm going to highlight these here, go back to this. That's the Cady Fields. That is, I'm slightly off there, the Burren area, which is also the, those areas were, in, were the first areas in, brought in. Um, and it appears, I was talking to uh, Seamus Caulfield, met him in Dublin, the guy discoverer, his father was a discoverer of the Katie Fields, and we had a long discussion on this, and he's fairly confident that the earliest settlements in the Katie Fields was within a few hundred years of that flooding of that sea. Um, 
First, they would have been land-based, the people, and at the same time, I talked about the ones coming from the, the there's an Egyptian influence coming up with Sersa. And the Egyptian influence comes in, and I think, and I say this thing because there's more evidence, but it looks the way it lies, that the uh, Egyptian influence were more on the east of Ireland. Um, the likes of, because what comes into New Grange, what comes down in Waterford, is fundamentally or slightly different to what happens out in, in the west of Ireland. There are two subtly different areas there. Oh, turn that off. That's a zoom up of it again. And again, just to highlight that area, the KG fields are there. But what we're discussing is basically in this area, but they're now finding it all over the place. And they're also some of the earliest important settlements are also here, here, and in fact this whole general area. So it's not just located to the KD Fields. The KD Fields are one we've identified now, but when you look at Caramore, etc., there's a whole lot more in there. Turn that off, and then let me introduce you to the KD Fields, or let someone else introduce you to the KD Fields. site here above the Atlantic in County Mayo. It's called Cada Fields, which means the flat-topped hills. So the fields here are marked out by rocks that were discovered back in the 1930s. They had laid under the bog for thousands and thousands of years. But in the 1930s, a school teacher here noticed something odd when he was digging his turf. And that was that there were these large boulder stones which seemed to be in an organized pattern underneath where the turf would be. So this was unusual and he thought that he had discovered something from maybe past times but it was his son who was an archaeologist who really developed the site further finding that this was actually a land system from our stone age farmers. So the first farmers here had laid out a field pattern, the oldest in the world, in this area here and there is now something like i think it's 10 kilometers of this stone walls that are now visible around the site and um, it's just amazing there's there is an interpretive center here behind me but you don't need to be in the interpretive center because out here is where the exhibit is here is where you see everything and the guides can take you around and show you but we are going to explore further here this amazing site, which, by the way, was here before the pyramids, before Stonehenge. Can you imagine that? head in the distance. That is a layout of some of the walls, a fairly early picture. Um, but that is a field structure and with no defences, with houses. Um, there was no fear in that, there was no um, protection defense. It was a sort of a, and that area, what to me the most staggering thing about it was it was abandoned four millennia ago. You know, that was when they finished with it. <laughs> the other thing I want to show you is this. That is from Rathlin Island, Personal Light. And that is the best axe head material almost anywhere, certainly in thing. That and its sisters found its way to the Middle East in the Stone Age. They came for it from Rathlin Island. 
There were only two sites it could have come from. And this is one example of the type of things that were going on before any... The stories you hear about, oh, some man came with a little coracle with an ox hung over his neck and paddled across. Absolute rubbish. <laughs> we are, that has been written by victors who do not want the true story being told what goes on. And Ireland became a major supplier of gold. Personal light was the first. Fish, and in fact, and I'm trying to think of the names because I haven't written on my notes, which aren't up here. There were Kappa, Lugan, and I'll think of the other one. Um, they were the first people in Ireland, and they were meant to set, settle in Mount Sandal, but they were only seasonal. They came for the exotic bits and pieces and went back in the winter time. Um, but the first, according to our literature, and they're, they're mentioned, and the name one was a doctor, the other was a Wainwright, which made things, um, and one was a fisherman. Um, but um, Ireland then got to be seen for later days, the dyes, um, but the biggest to begin with was the copper. And the next of the series is how the people came over from... Um, from Greece, from uh, Sardinia, from Crete, to gather up and to bring the people with them to mine the copper. And that's for the next one. I was told not to pass the R, I'm at one minute. But what I'm doing here is the last thing. These are the ancient, this is from your hillies. These are the ancient sites of mines. I'm going to zoom in on the KG fields. Copper, copper. I go down to the Barren area, which is talking mostly the again material. And if you look at the red dots or the brownie dots, they are closely associated with all the major um, known early early settlements. It's again another evidence that they were looking for materials and coming through. And I'm going to end this talk with this one anyhow with another Francis Bacon talk, which I think is probably really relevant and I'll let you read it for yourselves. And that's my bit. Thank you very much. Oh, I started a book, and I thought, nobody reads history books. Um, so it's a, these are stories, but with historical fact. Historical fiction, if you like. I'm using all the names and the facts that went on in the records that are coming through. But they are, the first one is, from a child's point of view, the flooding of the Black Sea. The second one is... Egypt and talks about the different philosophies and beliefs and then the third one is the arrival into Ireland um, and then the last and final thing I'm going to say is I came to I never because of those joining the dots I never liked his story because his story didn't seem to join the dots together so I would like you to hear my story and I hopefully you'll end up finding your history and I think it's important that you question everything I've said everything everyone else has said, and you use your own power of discretion to make your history up that you're happy with, that makes sense, that fits in, not just because you've learned it by rote. Thank you very much. I thought I was going to get away. <laughs> no, you're not away yet. Hello. That was for you, Jim. I hope you appreciate it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, look, uh, um, uh, a quick, very quick uh, question session. If anybody has any specific question for Michael. Um, We'll deal with that first, and then I'm going to call on the Reverend John, our, our vice chairperson, to give a vote of thanks. So uh, if there are any questions, you're all blown away. <laughs> Same as myself. Sorry, yes, we have somebody. Does the DNA bearing that information out? Does, does DNA bear yes. your information out? Yes, interestingly, the DNA 
of people in Ireland, either we had a much, much, much bigger population than we had, or it was frequently being replaced by numerous people. And that would fit in very, very well with the trading. Because I'm, I think you're going to find out that I'm, in the next talk, I'm going to tell you that there was trading going on. So people came up, Namidian came up with 300 ships to get rid of the pain of the Fomorians that were attacking all their bits and pieces. But that gives you the idea of size and numbers transporting and moving. So yes, I think DNA does and more and more. That DNA I showed you the slide was on the Ballyhattie. There were three burial sites that were um, analysed. One was on Rathlin Island, the other I think was on the Ards Peninsula, I'm not sure where the third one, and all of them show Egyptian and, and Middle Eastern connections. Um, you'll see uh, Egypt coming up over and over and over again. Heck, we even got the name Scotia from Scotia was a pharaoh's daughter, which will come later on in the series, and that is throughout Ireland. You'll see connections with Egypt coming forward. So that answers your question. Okay. Anything else? Okay. If there's nothing uh, else, we'll ask uh, the Reverend John to do the necessary. We have been treated to a feast here this evening, and Michael uh, seems to be a very modest man. Hear me? Yeah. Right. Uh, that, okay, you can hear me now. Uh, Michael is a very quiet man, very modest, but what knowledge? I could have listened for a long time. And I think you've been very, very fair, particularly to the clergy here, because not only did you quote from the ancient resources as well, you quoted from the Bible. And that's keeping the balance. Uh, and I think you're very sensitive, you know, to uh, our um, uh, membership and to our audience here. But such a wealth of knowledge that you've learnt uh, quite a lot. And... Um, uh, my his history, knowledge of history, you know, are just uh, piecemeal and it has stopped at a certain point. And I've listened to other historians and read what they had to say. And uh, in a sense, some of it is quite childish. But Megal here has uh, clothed the skeleton and he's given us an awful lot to think about. And I, for one, look forward to. Uh, our next lecture. But on behalf of all of you here, we want to thank Michael uh, for um, uh, standing here. And I noticed virtually uh, with the notes and uh, giving us the knowledge uh, that he has experienced and worked on and built up and felt uh, over the years. Uh, and certainly the story, his story, uh, has become very, very personal to him. And uh, I thank you, Michael, for imparting that knowledge uh, to us here this evening. And again, we look forward to our future lectures. Okay, thank you. I think I mentioned at the start, I think I mentioned at the start that, uh, that uh, Michael is actually a related to the O'Sullivan clan. Um, he hadn't time to go into that tonight. He will at a future date. But he has a book on that subject, on the O'Sullivans, which is available down at the back. So thank you very much for your attention. I think uh, you have a lot to think about. We all have a lot to think about. It's given us a, a, a new uh, aspect on, on history. Generally, as I said at the start, I, I, I think I had a, some sort of a Archimedes type thing at the, when I first visited the KG Fields with a group 
from the O'Neill Country Historical Society about 10 years ago. Anyway, we'll not hold you. I think there's some tea at the back. And thank you very much for, for coming tonight in such a, such a, a cold night. Thank you. <laughs>